My friend Penny, she worked for uh, the county coroner's office as a post-mortem transportation technician. That means uh, she picked up the recently deceased in a van and either took him to the morgue or the medical examiner. It was a two, three person operation in which Penny was responsible for gathering information from the police, sympathizing with family members, and guiding them through the papers that they needed to read and sign. Her partners were responsible for getting the cadaver in a body bag and strapping it to a gurney. Penny had many stories to tell. <laughs> I loved hearing them. <laughs> One day, the muscle side of Penny's crew isn't available and she needs some help. At the time, I was working at some heinous sports bar slash restaurant as a 30-year-old cleanup dolt. <laughs> so she knows I'm broke and available during the day. Plus, I had previously expressed an interest or at least a curiosity with her line of work. So she gives me a call. On the way to the scene, she explains that I'll only be helping her with natural deaths. Boo. <laughs> because... Uh, you have to be cleared with the county medical examiner through some sort of processing or licensing or some bullshit for unnatural deaths. Murders, suicides, and uh, accidents, they tend to leave behind quite an extraordinary mess. As we drive to our first stop to pick up a deceased senior in the upper class regions of Coronado, Penny tells me one of her more remarkable stories involving the Coronado Bridge. <coughs> so, some corporate hotshot with an office looking out at the bridge uh, got a call from his mistress who danced at one of the local strip clubs. Before calling her married lover, she managed to lower herself down to a perch outside the bridge's railing on the Coronado side, which hangs over the pavement. From this perilous strip of bridge, she got her sugar daddy to look out his window to locate her. She then waved, made sure he could see her, tossed herself onto the side, and jumped. There were no actual eyewitnesses aside from the cheating husband, but people did report hearing and even feeling a ground-shaking thud. Apparently, when this exotic dancer had enough of being the secret leftover lunch and hopped off her ledge, she sailed through the air and then landed on her back. The implex split her chest wide open, rupturing right down the middle of her sternum and sending her double D implants everywhere. The contents of her Dr. Crafter rack exploded, instantly painting the area in a concoction of silicone and blood. Now mix that in with brain matter skull bits and saturated strands of long teased out hair, and you've got overtime pay for the corner cleanup crew. <laughs> and a very easy transport for Penny's van. <laughs> However... Penny assures me that I won't have the privilege to deal with anything that horrific, so I feel fine about the job ahead of me, except for my lack of experience. I ask her, uh, don't you think it might be a little weird for me to go in there with no experience? Uh, I mean, won't the, family, won't the family find that, I don't know, to be, like, not cool? Penny puts my worry at ease by telling me that family members rarely want to be present when their loved one is being zipped up in a body bag. She even goes on to say that family members almost always stay outside the room and sometimes out of the house when their relative's body is being handled. She says that as long as we keep our voices down, they will have no idea that I'm a last-minute, inexperienced, untrained replacement for two knowledgeable professionals. When we arrive, Penny does her thing with the cops and the grandson of the deceased while I awkwardly sit and wait in silence. After the paperwork's done, we make our way down the hall to retrieve the body from the master bedroom. That's when we notice the grandson is following us. Penny tells him he probably doesn't want to be present during the procedure, but he's adamant about being present. <laughs> with that, he passes her to lead us to the bedroom, and Penny gives me a look like, Fuck, sorry, dude. What is this paper here? Inside the bedroom, we find a tall man in his 70s, I'd say about six foot two at least, lying face down with nothing on but socks. The lower half of his body is in the bathroom and the rest is in the bedroom. He must have died directly after taking a dump. Otherwise, 
All of his contents of his bowels and bladder would have been forming a crusted liquid patty all over him, the linoleum, the carpet, and eventually me. To add to the pleasant surprise of the scene being devoid of discharged feces, anal mucus, and soured urine, the guy doesn't stink much either. I would have thanked him out loud, but since his grandson is sitting on the corner of the bed, expressionlessly, watching our every move like an uptight supervisor, I keep my appreciation to myself. I have no idea what I'm doing, so I just follow Penny in putting on some rubber gloves and the cues she gives. Looks like we need to roll him over, get him in the body bag, and then slide him onto the gurney, she says. I play along and ask as if I already know the answer. Uh, the room's pretty small, so I can't lay him uh, the gurney alongside him. Better turn him over and get him to the center room, then put him in a body bag, and then a gurney. Don't you think? <laughs> Penny agrees, and I glance up at the grandson, but he seems content in his seated statue pose, where he remains during the rest of the time. With nothing to go on but intuition, I squat down and I grab the decaying man's shoulders, lifting his torso with a slight twist in an attempt to turn him face up. It's right then and there, I immediately understand the origins of the term dead weight. It's like trying to move an extra heavy futon with limbs and a floppy head. <laughs> the mass overwhelms me and I have to reposition myself quickly sitting on my ass, and I'm trying my best not to grunt or lose my grip in front of the grandson. This is the last time I give the concerned and fucking weird grandson any of my attention. <laughs> By this point, I'm sitting down with my legs stretched out in front of me. My arms are under the cool body's armpits, and I'm holding him semi-upright like a giant puppet. I get the dead man's torso almost completely right side up while Penny, outside of her normal routine of paperwork and consolation, pitches in to do the same with his legs and hips. I give him one last jerk. The momentum of my final twist swings his dangling head from one side to the other and his cold, purple, blood-heavy cheek rests upon the side of my forehead. Apparently, since he was fates down, his stagnant blood is gathered at the bottom of what is now just a slowly stiffening sack, leaving the entire front side of his body in a purple tint. With his lifeless jaw pressed against my hairline, I lift him up further so that his torso and hips are fully facing the ceiling, kind of like arching my back. During this bout of manual labor, his once inactive chest audibly gurgles in the slushy, directionless blood that's now being shaken about. Through the corner of my eye, I bear witness to the stale, misplaced globs and streams of mucus, saliva, and rotting blood that the newly disturbed gases are pushing out of his nose and mouth. I finally get the corpse where I want it and let his weight just guide him to the floor. However, this rapid placement of his new resting position pushes out even more gas. Choruses of sounds release as the fumes roll over his voice box, <laughs> producing ghostly moans that spatter out through his nose and mouth and swirled bubbles of rotting blood, bile, and refuse. <laughs> On his backside, I can see the full effects of death. The front side of his body is flattened, and varies in shades of murky, dark, and red and blue. The parts of his body that took on the majority of his weight are lightly black and purple and level as a cutting board, including his shriveled, squash, blood-heavy penis. <laughs> a flaccid white guy's dick is nothing to look at, but a flaccid white guy's dead dick <laughs> is just flat-out disturbing. There's an old saying that goes, if you're going to die, die with your boots on. After this experience, I modified it. If you're going to die, die with your pants on. Can leak, everybody. Thanks so much. He's got books for sale up in the front there also. So if you like what you hear.